I want to say good morning and welcome to our April program. The Solon Chamber of Commerce serves as an advocate for the business community by supporting and fostering vibrant economic growth. We are a member organization governed by a volunteer board of directors. My name is Tom Jackson. I'm an insurance agent with Leverity Insurance, and I am the chairman of the board of directors at the chamber for 2021. It's my pleasure to kick off our program today. I have support from our chamber staff, Tom Bennett and Kaylin Mills. And we will forego the Pledge of Allegiance until we are together in person again. As a member organization, the Chamber relies on involvement, leadership, and support from our members to fulfill our mission. Our support levels are as follows. Uh, you can see the civic leaders come in at a minimum contribution of $4,000. And so we, we look at Swagelock, Raptite, Aflac, Nestle, and the law firm of Maznak Ryder uh, uh, here in Solon. Um, we also have our key investors, which come in at a level of 25,000, I'm sorry, $2,500. And then we have our corporate level sponsors at $1,000. And before we get to today's program, let me just highlight a few upcoming events and programs at the chamber. On June 3rd, we have a collaboration with the city of Solon and the Chamber of Commerce for a job fair, uh, hoping to pair our employers and job seekers in filling the many jobs that are available uh, in and around Solon. Also want to make a note about tax credit eligibility for paid leave as part of the American Rescue Plan. And also uh, grants for career certificates through the TechCred program here in Ohio. And all information on these programs can be found uh, at the Chamber website. And this program will be, uh, is being recorded and will be posted as well. Finally, I'd like to recognize the sponsor of today's program, the financial services firm of CBiz MHM. And from CBiz serving on, as a board of directors is Dennis Linden. And as you can see, CBiz offers accounting, insurance, and HR services. And again, Denny's contact information is right there. And as with many of our accounting friends, uh, so many of them are caught up in their uh, customer work right now. So Denny has been, is unable to be with us today. As we move into our program today, you can communicate and ask questions with the staff through the chat function. And we ask that you keep your microphones off and your cameras on through the program unless called on to speak. And comments from our guests will be followed by a Q&A session and we'll be sure to close out by 1 p.m. As taxpayers in Ohio and residents of Ohio, it's fair to ask who manages our money? And the Ohio treasurer is just one of five statewide elected positions in the executive branch, along with the governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and the state auditor. And the treasurer oversees the state's investment and debt portfolios, domestic and international custody portfolios, and the annual cash movements and deposits. We have a couple of poll questions uh, that we're asking you to take part in. So we'll bring those up and if you can please answer those questions and be sure to hit the submit button. As we run through the poll questions, I will introduce our guest. Robert Sprague was elected treasurer in 2018 after serving in the House of Representatives from 2011 to 2018. Prior to that, he served as the city auditor and treasurer in his hometown of Finley, Ohio. During his time in the private sector, he was a project lead at Ernst & Young before forming his own consulting firm. He and his wife and family still reside in Finley. Treasurer Spray graduated from Duke University with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering 
and a master's degree in business administration from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Treasurer Sprague is committed to improving Ohio and the lives of its residents through trusted stewardship, wise investment, and bold innovation. He has ushered in the next generation of the Ohio checkbook and launched Results Ohio. And both efforts have brought more accountability to the spending within the state. And here to provide us with more insight into the Ohio checkbook and Results Ohio, and to provide a legislative ex, uh, uh, update is Ohio Treasurer Robert Sprague. Treasurer Sprague. Okay. Oh, forget to, there you go. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you're perfect. All right, great, great. Well, it's great to be with you again. Uh, we had a chance to speak back in June of last year. And so I guess this is, must be our yearly meeting from now on. Uh, but really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today virtually. Um, let me just give you kind of an update from the last time that we spoke. You know, last year we had to fight the COVID-19 and all those economic challenges that are brought with us. I think at our last time that we spoke, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was back in June. Uh, we weren't sure if the economy was gonna bounce back. Uh, we were very concerned about the business community. Um, and then we talked about our commitment to small businesses and our concern about small businesses in the state and what was going to happen there. Um, and one of the things that occurred through the CARES Act allocation that the state received um, was that we decided to unveil a proposal that would really target and help a lot of the small business people, maybe some of which uh, that are on your call today. And we felt like that was very important because small businesses do the majority of hiring in the state of Ohio. The majority of the growth that our community see is through small business. And we felt that the small businesses were the most impacted uh, by the coronavirus and, and the ensuing uh, 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 epidemic. And so we wanted to make sure that there was at least $100 million carved out specifically to help small business bounce back from this and be able to get through what was a very difficult time. And shortly after we introduced that concept, uh, about a month later, I was so pleased that Governor DeWine and the legislative leaders in the General Assembly enacted a very similar plan with using $125 million of the CARES Act money and setting that aside for small business. Um, and we're very pleased with the way that went and I think it's really helped small business bounce back. I uh, also wanted to mention that our office has some longstanding things that we do to help small businesses. And last year was no exception. We have a link deposit program. And by the way, if you're a small business listening today, I hope that you'll take advantage of the program or look into taking advantage of the program. Uh, we, have, we have this link deposit program for small businesses and the loans that you take out and what we do essentially is we put a deposit with uh, that bank that you get the loan through. And we put that deposit as part of our $18 billion state portfolio. And instead of accepting a market interest rate for that, in, uh, that CD, we actually accept then a, a, a reduction in interest rate. And that reduction in interest rate uh, percent for percent is passed on to you uh, as the business owner, as a reduction on your loan cost. So it's another way that we can use the state's balance sheet to help small businesses across the state and to help us as we recover from this pandemic. And some people say, well, uh, look, the, the interest rate environment is very favorable right now and the loans are cheap and that's true. Uh, but look, the interest rate environment is probably gonna change in the future. And I want you to know that that program exists because it's a way that we can help small businesses, not just now, but in the future, if you wanna take advantage of it. So it's our Grow Now program, it's, it's our link deposit program, uh, and we're very pleased with that. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're gonna expand that link deposit program in the near future. I am very pleased to report to you that we are launching a new initiative called Family Forward. And this helps families with adoption in our state. Um, you may not realize this, but it's shocking to know that the cost of adoption in the state of Ohio now approaches $40,000 to $50,000 per child uh, in some cases, particularly in private adoptions. 
which is incredibly expensive, as you can imagine, for a young family. So our program, again, helps those young families with any loans that they may have to take out uh, for the adoption process. Again, we can lower the interest rate on those loans and, and help chip away at some of the cost of adoptions to encourage um, uh, both the children and the families that want to go through the adoption process and help a child find their forever home uh, here in the state of Ohio. So we're very excited about that. It's called our Family Forward Initiative. Um, also wanted to give you an update on our stable accounts. Last time we spoke, I think I mentioned the stable accounts. These are accounts for individuals who are living with disabilities in our communities. Um, just to give you some background, the reason that these accounts exist is because uh, we have a federal rule that if you have more than $2,000 in your name, uh, the state has to take away your Medicaid benefits um, if you're living with a disability. And so if you'd like to live independently, you'd like to have a job in the private sector um, and be able to earn your own money and save your own money, uh, the way to do that is through a stable account, which gets around this problem of having your Medicaid benefits or your social, your social security benefits taken away. It's a phenomenal program. Uh, we run the largest and I think the best uh, program in the country uh, with our stable account program. And it's been challenging. I can't tell you any different that uh, we've had some real challenges in the year 2020 because it used to be that we would go out in person and talk to families and have them explain to them what the accounts did and make sure that they had no trouble signing up for, for these accounts. Uh, we weren't able to do that last year, but our team did a fantastic job adapting. Uh, we went to remote meetings and I'm very pleased to report that uh, when I took office, we had about 9,000 families that we helped uh, through the stable account program. Today, we have more than 23,000 families that we now serve through the stable account program. And we showed this last year, we actually posted uh, the largest number of account additions in the history of the stable program. We had the largest week, the largest month, uh, and the largest day in terms of new account signups for the stable account program. So we're very proud of that. And we're, we're proud of um, our team and what they've done to achieve those goals. And we're gonna keep that program around for a long time to serve uh, families and individuals who are living with disabilities in our state. Um, I wanted to, to also mention our financial literacy advocacy efforts. Um, my son, Graham, had an opportunity to go through a phenomenal program offered by OSU Extension. Uh, we have five children, and uh, I often tell people that nowadays having a, a big family is a little bit weird. It's a little bit like having a waterbed. It used to be that everybody had one, uh, but now they're just strange. So my son, Graham, is my third child, and he went through this OSU Extension financial literacy program and uh, it was phenomenally successful. He had a terrific time. It's a simulated event. So it's hands-on learning for the kids. It's called Real Money, Real World. And last month, we were excited in the treasurer's office to announce uh, a partnership with OSU Extension's Real Money, Real World program to get that into more classrooms and let those kids, through that experiential learning, understand more about financial literacy. Uh, one of our top priorities is to make sure that uh, Ohio's young people have the skills that they need to reach their life's goals. And we think our financial literacy program is a big part of that. So stay tuned with more information about um, our OSU extension programs as, school, as schools emerge from the coronavirus. Uh, that's going to become much more active across the state of Ohio. And we're so enthused about reaching out to those young people. Uh, and seeing if we can make a difference in their lives and in their financial literacy um, to give them a foundation there. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention is one of the programs that we have created in the treasurer's office, uh, truly out of public policy necessity, in my opinion, and that is to be able to try new innovative ideas from a public policy perspective uh, through the private sector and be able to link with them and pay them 
for the things that produce results that they're able to solve some of our public sector problems. Um, I say that we use Ohio's brightest minds in the private sector to tackle Ohio's biggest problems in the public sector. Uh, and the way that it works is very simple. It's, it's like a typical government grant program, uh, but uh, we, only, we actually measure the results of the project. It's all data driven. So there's no place for a bad project to hide. And uh, at the end, we, if the pilot project achieves results, it gets paid for by the state. So all the upfront costs are with the private nonprofit groups um, and the state only pays on the back end if that pilot project produces results. So it's a new financial tool really that we're offering through the treasurer's office to policymakers throughout our state uh, to try these new uh, private sector pilot programs, which nationally is called pay for success, pay for success programs. Um, so we're very excited with the progress that we've made there. Uh, we're currently going through the legislative process and we have some phenomenal projects that have been uh, um, basically part of our application, our first application period for Results Ohio. And I think you'll be impressed with the breadth uh, of topics that they cover. One of them covers helping people, coach people out of poverty uh, and helps them with sustained employment in our state. Another project tackles the addiction uh, of, of narcotics and other drugs in our state through actually a data-driven piece of software that uh, the engine behind that is Google. And so they proposed a project to help people into recovery and sustain recovery. Um, and we also have a, a terrific project that tackle, tackles infant mortality in the state of Ohio. As you probably know, uh, the, the, in the state of Ohio, African-American babies die at a rate of three to four times white children in the first year of life, which is just shameful for our state. And so this project would address that. And they've got some incredible data that they're relying on to see if that can be fixed. Um, and then one of the projects actually deals with uh, Lake Erie and the algae bloom in Lake Erie, trying to reduce the phosphorus content uh, by building uh, wetlands in the Maumee watershed. So a lot of interesting private sector pilot projects that we are trying out and have been proposed as a part of Results Ohio. And you can just see the innovation and the creativity that's occurring because of that new financial tool that we're offering through the treasurer's office. Um, so I hope that you, if you have any questions about any of our programs, I hope that you'll visit uh, www.ohiotreasurer.gov for more details on these programs. And also want to acknowledge our, our, the, the state of Ohio's uh, best regional representative, Becca Armstrong, who's also on the call with us today. And if you have any questions about any of those programs, uh, Becca can find the answers to those questions and put you in touch with the right people at the treasurer's office uh, to get your questions answered. So with that, Tom, appreciate your time and also would be happy to take any questions that you have time for today. Thanks. Sure, thank you very much, Treasurer. Uh, we do have some questions. I'm gonna kick it over to Tom Bennett uh, with the Chamber who's been monitoring the chat and has a couple of questions. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Tom, and thank you, uh, Treasurer Sprague for your presentation. It's amazing. You know, when I look back from last June, you talked about all those programs, but I don't think I had the ability to focus because there was so, so much uncertainty. Uh, looming on, on what are we doing, what are the programs. So it was great to get an update, uh, you know, more specific information about these uh, programs. Uh, before I jump into to maybe some of those specific questions, uh, is there an update on, uh, you know, on the state budget, uh, you know, from the, the legislative side of uh, Ohio's government? Absolutely. Um, it's pretty incredible. You're not going to believe this, but the state budget, we are actually far ahead of where we expected to be at this particular juncture. In fact, our income tax revenues are running well ahead of the estimated projections that were made two years ago. 
so we're running ahead of our projections on the income tax. It's extremely strong. Uh, there's kind of been, I don't know, I question the national narrative about uh, unemployment. I can just tell you in the state of Ohio, employment has been very, very strong. Uh, and the number one concern that we hear of from employers as we're talking with people throughout the state is that they can't hire enough people. Um, so the income tax has been very strong. The sales tax has outperformed uh, materially what we anticipated at this juncture, um, to, again, two years ago, outperforming budget. Uh, and then our costs are down as a state as well. We've done cost saving stays. We have, we've done a hiring freeze. And so we haven't rehired people that have retired or left. And as a result, the state budget, uh, if you combine that along with some additional CARES Act funding, some increased uh, FMAP, which is a real technical thing about how we get reimbursed for Medicaid expenses from the federal government, we are running all told about two to $2.3 billion ahead of where we thought we would be at this time. Uh, and that's in addition to our $2.6 billion rainy day fund Quite frankly, we all thought we were going to have to tap into back in May and June, uh, but because revenues have recovered, uh, that hasn't even been tapped into yet. So, um, and then we're expecting to receive another $11 billion from the federal government, half of which will go to the individual municipalities and local governments, uh, and, and about five point, uh, I think it's $5.6 billion will come directly to the state of Ohio. So that's kind of our financial picture right now. Awesome, thank you for uh, for that update. Yeah, I've been following and and I, I've seen no controversy on the on the budget yet. So that's good news that uh, we're ahead and and those revenues uh, are, are ahead of where uh, you anticipated when doing this process two years ago. So I have a a, a question. Uh, you know, as we continue this pass this path forward, um, and what we like to call here at the at the Solon Chamber, like the next PPP, which is not funding, it's post-pandemic prosperity. Um, have you started to see the increase in number of applications for your various programs? Um, I'll tell you what, the, the stable account signups have been very strong. Um, we, we, we wish that there were more interest in our linked deposit programs, but look, I mean, the interest rate environment is so low, people can go to the bank and, and find very reasonable financing at this point. Um, and I think our main concern probably at this point going forward really is uh, we're starting to hear inflationary concerns uh, from businesses and from the public at large, wondering the impact that, that that's gonna have on the Federal Reserve's uh, stance, their very dovish stance right now uh, and how that might play into interest rates in the future. I think you're seeing that as part of the uh, long end of the yield curve too. The inflation expectations tick up. So uh, as I said in, in my remarks, I think in the future you will see an opportunity to use some of these linked deposits again uh, because interest rates will increase. Okay, so the, the linked accounts, yeah, at deposit is something that, uh, you know, I sort of question why, why isn't everybody doing that, you know, regardless of, of interest rates. So as a chamber, uh, how do we how do we get that word out? Is it, is, do the financial institutions know about this and are they pushing that? Uh, or is it really just, you know, education, education and education to let people know when the time is right that this is here for you? I think a lot of it also is what you said, it's education. I know that we have an Ag Link program that I didn't mention because, uh, you know, I know that you're uh, a little bit more of a, a suburban area. But uh, our agling program is really well subscribed. And the reason for that is because those family farms, they come back year after year for those working cap, basically a planting loan uh, every year. And so, you know, we just need to do a better job, I think, in the treasurer's office and throughout the state of getting small businesses acclimated and, and uh, knowing that that program is out there. Awesome. Um, so just as far as from, from your perspective, you know, and where you sit, what do you see as the biggest challenges, uh, you know, that businesses face today and, and moving forward? I think that, um, the business challenge, biggest challenge for businesses moving forward here, uh, is, is, and, and this may not exactly hinge on, on the financials. I think the financials are good. 
You're seeing increased demand across the board. Uh, and, and frankly, everybody's got money in their pocket at this point. Uh, <laughs> people are, are, you know, there's very strong demand and GDP as we know is 68, 68 and um, uh, consumption. I think what, what businesses are, are concerned about as I travel the state is more regulatory, more regulatory in nature, some regulatory and tax uncertainty now on a go forward basis um, about what's gonna happen in the next couple of years. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint. And I think that uncertainty is beginning to, to cause concern in the business community. And so I think, you know, the more, and we tried very hard, I think, in the state of Ohio to provide regulatory stability over the last five years and tax stability over the last five years. Um, and you can talk about the different programs, whether it's Bureau of Workers' Comp, the Bureau's Workers' Comp system has performed very well um, over the last decade. And a lot of that's investment returns, but it also has done a great job of um, really shoring up some key pieces in the Bureau of Workers' Comp system to make it more effective and efficient. Uh, or regulatory uh, policy, whether you're talking about uh, oil and gas drilling, uh, or you know just general regulatory policy that's coming out of the state of Ohio. I think on the horizon, businesses are, are concerned about the changing regulatory environment and some of the rules that they face um, coming from the federal government. And uh, that uncertainty is there for, for some industries. Um, and thank you for that perspective. It's, it's uh, you know, not one that I certainly think of, you know, first, I think of, you know, workforce development. Uh, and now I'm a business owner and I might have challenges hiring. But then if I'm looking at financial uncertainty, you know, it's adding to the stress. Do I, add, do I even add people if I'm going to have to cut, uh, you know, in the future based on, you know, based on the unknown? So the, the million dollar question, I'm setting you up for it right now. HB 197, which allows the income earned by employees currently working remotely due to the COVID emergency. Is there legislative support to continue this emergency legislation? Uh, you know, as it, as, as it will have a I'm defining adverses as positive or negative. It's going to affect just about every municipality in, you know, in the state if, uh, you know, if things were to change. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, there's, there's a lot of House bills that are introduced. I'm not familiar with the uh, details of House Bill 197, but I can tell you this, uh, that, you know, probably in the state of Ohio on a go forward basis, um, this is a good time for us to have a conversation not just about House Bill 197 and the details around that, but really a more general conversation about how we collect taxes in the state of Ohio. Whether we do that through income taxes, whether we do it through sales taxes or property taxes. Um, you see other states uh, like Florida, uh, who is uh, I think gaining congressional seats, uh, like Texas, who's also gaining congressional seats. Um, and uh, Tennessee, that's, I think, uh, also gaining population, you know, they, they've chosen to move to, you know, more of a sales tax model, more of a consumption based tax model. Um, and uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to, to talk about how we want to, you know, the types of taxes um, and the nexus that we have to our local governments on a go forward basis, because we may have to change some things. Um, in order to remain competitive because this new work environment is not going away. I think we all realize it now. It's just, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of our employees and, and a lot of work, not all the work, but a lot of work that can be done, can be done more efficiently from home or remotely. And uh, that's gonna be the way of the world. And I think you're gonna see it. You mentioned the workforce issue. Uh, the workforce issue is real. I personally believe that's a demographics issue, a systemic issue that's actually going to be long tailed into the future. I think, you know, in other words, I don't think that this is a temporary thing. I know that people are upset about, not upset, but they're concerned about the, the unemployment benefits being extended and people, you know, being paid to be stay, stay at home. But I think underlying that, there's also a reality that there's simply not enough people in the future uh, that are going to be in the workforce to produce all the things that we want to produce as a state. And so I think that workforce issue is systemic and I think it's going to continue into the future and whoever has the workforce is going to win. And some of those, some of that talent is going to want to have more flexibility in their schedules. And I think employers 
are, are going to make allowances for that. So we're going to have to think about this strategically. How do we compete? How do we compete with Florida and Texas and other states? Um, and, and this may provide an opportunity to have that conversation. Absolutely. I think there are, uh, you know, several opportunities from a workforce development and, you know, connecting education to workforce. And, you know, what you bring up from that tax perspective is, you know, is this, uh, you know, the opportunity to have that conversation that uh, the way we were doing things may not be the way that we're, you know, doing it forward you know, from a, from a tax perspective. I mean, we can't have the world change from a remote standpoint uh, and all these things happen and then not really address how uh, how we're funding our, you know, our city government. So, you know, I, I definitely appreciate that perspective and, and, you know, definitely something we're paying close attention to um, because we've got, you know, over 900 businesses in Solon. Uh, so there's a pretty good, you know, income tax base, uh, you know, that, that funds a lot of, you know, world-class services. Um, so I think my, my, my last question that I have, uh, unless, uh, some folks are, are chiming in from, from the audience is, you know, really, uh, you know, re related to, and it's really more a matter of if there is, what is a takeaway that participants today or those that watch this recording, what's the one thing they need to, they should do from your perspective or your office to learn more about what you do, because we're all busy. We all have, you know, but if I take the time to, I, I spent a lot of time on your site before this presentation, I was amazed by the programs. I'm saying, why aren't people doing that? Um, but if there's one thing, you know, that, that you guys do that say, I want people to talk about one of the five programs you talked about, what would that be? I think it's uh, you know, in general that we, we view ourselves really as a service organization. We serve other agencies in the state. We are the banker for the state of Ohio. Um, and our goals are very simple. We want to be trusted stewards of Ohio's taxpayer dollars. We want to be bold innovators for the people of the state of Ohio. And we want to be wise investors in the future of Ohio. And we want to, we want to serve not just our state agencies and the state as a whole, but we also want to serve our local governments and be a great local government partner. Um, so what I would hope that you would take away is that all of those programs are built to serve people of the state of Ohio and lo our local governments. Um, and we want to do everything in our power to make sure that our state is on solid financial footing. So thank you for the time today. I really appreciate it. And as I said before, if you need any additional information, Becca Armstrong on this call would be happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Treasurer Sprague. And I'd like to, you know, acknowledge uh, before we depart, uh, Mayor Krause from the City of Solon and uh, Lindsay Carr from the Ohio Attorney General's Office. I know me personally, Lindsay and Rebecca are fantastic. Uh, they're here for us. If we have questions, if somebody doesn't have a, you know, has a loan question, they may not be the one to to answer, but they're certainly putting us right in contact. So you're, you're, mentioning of a service organization, you know, I truly believe it. And I've certainly seen it, you know, uh, many, many times, countless times over the past 15 months on, I'm not sure where to turn to, or a, a company doesn't know this or that. So, you know, I appreciate, you know, the work that, that Rebecca uh, does. I mean, she gets back to me uh, in 10 seconds, you know, but, but before I've even hit send, she's got an answer for me. So um, I certainly appreciate her work uh, on that. Uh, the bonus for today, everybody, with its 81 degrees, uh, you have an additional 39 minutes of undocumented time that uh, people think that you are in a meeting. So, you know, take advantage, get outside, go for a walk before it turns 45 degrees again in, in Ohio. So thank you again, Treasurer Sprague. It's definitely great to catch up and, uh, you know, look forward to, to hearing the launch of some of these programs. Thank you. And I got one last slide for folks. We've got a uh, couple of in-person programming uh, opportunities for, uh, you know, folks that are, are comfortable with that. Uh, we've got a business after five this Thursday at uh, Adrenaline Monkey from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, and then we're going to do a Chamber Coffee Networking event uh, next uh, a week from Thursday on May 6th from 8.30 to 9.30 you know, at Heritage Coffee. So uh, look, you know, be on a look at as we uh, try different things over the next couple of months, what's in person, what stays this way. Uh, but we look forward to seeing anyone who is able to uh, join us at one of these two events. Uh, super excited and, and 
one last thank you to Treasurer Sprague and uh, have a good day. And you got, now you have 38 minutes. I, I, I took an extra minute of your time. So my apologies. Have a good day, everybody.